Galatians chapter 5, and we're going to begin with verse 16 tonight. Now these uh, passages that we're going to look at, verses 16, 17, and 18, in this particular chapter, I believe are some of the most important verses in all of Scripture. I believe that because they reveal some of the most important truths for you to learn how to walk with the Lord. As we go through these particular verses, I think you will come to that conclusion with me. This is God's desire for freedom in your life. And that is what the theme of this particular chapter is all about. The beginning of chapter 5, Paul addresses the subject of standing fast in the freedom that we have in Christ. And he talked about how to do that and the cost of freedom. We looked at that particular topic last, in our last study. But tonight, we want to look at how do you actually get free? Because that's the point here in this particular text. How do you get free? And how do you stay free? in your personal spiritual walk. Very important. Read with me verses, verse 16. I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now what Paul does here is he first gives this exhortation to us to walk in the Spirit. Literally it's a command and we'll get to explaining why this is a command in just a moment. But this is the exhortation that he gives that gives a clear explanation of how a person gets free. They must walk in the Spirit. Now for our purposes here tonight, what I want to do is I want to see that that is first the command, but what I want to do is I kind of want to reverse the order of these passages so that we will take this issue last. I want to look really at verse 17 first because verse 17 reveals something that is very important. A truth that you must understand. And if you do not understand it, you will approach the problems and the struggles that you have with your flesh in the wrong way. Now, how do you get free? How did Paul explain this whole process? Well, first, he believed by stating here in verse 17 that the flesh lusts against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh. These two... These two entities that are inside of you are contrary to each other. They're constantly battling with each other, fighting with each other. Now, this particular truth is essential to understand because Paul is trying to help us to recognize the cause of the battle that is inside us. There is a war going on inside your life, inside of my life, every single day. There's a war. And if a Christian does not understand what is the cause of that war and why many times they don't have victory in their life, then they will always look to the wrong thing as the cause. I sit and have people tell me, Steve, you know, there must be something wrong with me because I'm just battling with my flesh. I'm just struggling and I'm failing and what's wrong with me? As if nobody else in the world has the same problem. They think that they are some unique sinner, some especially evil person, that something must be wrong with them because that's why this is happening and nobody else is having this problem. And usually their eyebrows go up and I just say, well, I'm having the same battle. <laughs> you, really? 
you're having the same struggle? Yes, I have the same struggle that you do every single day. And this helps a person to realize that, as Paul said, there is no temptation common that's not common to man. Everything that's going on in your life is going on in other people's lives, maybe not at the same time, but it will, or it has, or it will be one day. That's a fact. And so you have to recognize the cause of the battle. That cause of this battle that's going on inside you is you have two natures that are at war with each other inside. And that's what verse 17 declares. This is the problem. This is the battle that you are having. Now the scripture says in, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 3, that we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. Now, every one of us, before we come to Christ, Paul is saying there, we were by nature children of wrath. That was, that was our position. And all of us have a sinful nature, which is described here in the text as the flesh battling with the spirit. The old nature that is within you is termed the flesh. The new nature is termed the spirit. Paul also uses the terms the old man or the new man to describe this old nature and the new nature. Now this is an important truth because you must recognize what the battle is. What is going on inside you is the cause of your failure and your struggle. Notice he says here, this battle occurs so that you do not do the things that you wish. This is why you fail. This is why you don't always do the things that you want to do. Now, just because you have the will to do it doesn't mean that you're going to do it. We all know that by practical experience because we have said, I want to do this, and then we end up doing the wrong thing. Now, this is the conclusion that Paul the Apostle came to in his own life as well. He said in Romans chapter 7 and verse 19, he said, for the good that I will to do, I do not do. But the evil that I will not to do, that I practice. And so he's declaring here, I have a will not to do something and a will to do the right thing, but it just doesn't seem to happen. Why is that? He goes on in verse 17 of that same chapter. He said, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwells in me. For I know that in me that is in my flesh dwells no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. You see, the will, the desire is there, but how do I do it? That's the question. Where do I get the power to do what I want to do? And that is answered right here in the text. It's by the Spirit. And that's why I must walk in the Spirit. But before I will ever walk in the Spirit, I have to first know what the cause of my failure is. I must be absolutely sure it is my sinful nature. But the scripture says that he gives you a new nature. Second, uh, Second Peter 1.4. It says there that God has given us exceeding great and precious promises that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature. So God gives us a new nature, a nature just like his. And this is what enables us, gives us the capacity to do what is right. Now, many times people say, well, what is the nature of man, the old nature, this new nature? 
Well, it's just simply the capacity and the power to do that which is evil or the capacity and power to do that which is good. That's all your nature is. It is that, that issue that is inside every single one of us and it's, what, it's the driving force. It's the motivating force inside your life. Now, as Paul came to this conclusion that it was sin that was dwelling in him, it was his sinful nature that battled against him, then and only then could he deal with the real problem and know how to deal with it. Instead of beating himself up thinking, I'm some especially evil person, there's something wrong with me, I'm a defective human being. There's, you know, nobody else is struggling with, with these things of the flesh that I am. Well, yeah, there are different areas of the flesh that someone deals with. We're going to look at the works of the flesh in verses 19 through 21 in our next study. And you may not deal with the issue of adultery or fornication, but you may deal with hatred you may not deal with hatred, but you may deal with drunkenness. You may not deal with drunkenness, but you might deal with jealousy. I mean, there's many different areas of the flesh. You may not deal with the one I'm dealing with, but we're all dealing with the flesh. That's the bottom line. And that is where you need to be absolutely sure. Now, if you don't understand this and you don't believe this, then what you do is you take the totally the wrong approach or you just give up. And I see Christians do this all the time. If you don't understand that you have this sinful nature that is inside of you battling against you, then you will try in your own self-effort to try and change yourself instead of dealing with your sinful nature, you will try and reform your life. You'll try and just change enough to look like you're a Christian on the outside when the flesh rules you on the inside. And that is a losing battle. You will lose it. You will fall. Or some people, they just try willpower. Now, Paul tried that, and that's, what, that's the passage that we just read a minute ago. He tried willpower for a while. Other times, people try mind power. Well, you know, it's, it's all in your mind. If you think it's so, it is so. And that doesn't work either. Or sometimes people try good works. They try and be more good than they are evil. Well, that doesn't work either. Or sometimes people try and do more spiritual works than the other Christian down the street or sitting next to them. I'm going to do more spiritual good deeds than the next person. And all of that, all of these items are just self-effort. That's all they are. And they will not get you to the end that you're looking for. Other people just give up. They just go, I don't think I can get victory, and so I give up. Now, secondly, note what he declares here in verse 18. He says, but, I like that. Big contrast he's drawing here. There's this battle going on inside you, but notice what he says. But, if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now look at that phrase there where he says, if you're led by the Spirit. The word led is a Greek word that means to be guided or taken to a destination. So what is the destination? Where is the Holy Spirit leading me? What does he want, where does he want to take me? Well, the scripture is absolutely clear. He wants to take me to a place of victory. He wants to take me to a place of overcoming my fleshly nature that drives me to sin, that controls me on the inside. 
He wants to give me victory. So I know that is the destination. But will you allow yourself to be led to that destination? That's the question. And the whole issue is being led by the Spirit. If you want to walk in the Spirit, you have to first know the Spirit is your answer to control your flesh. And then secondly, you've got to let Him lead you. You've got to let Him take you to the end, the destination that He wants to bring you to. That destination goes through death putting to death the deeds of your body. If you uh, can, hold your finger here and turn over with me to Romans chapter 8. Here is Paul's explanation of the same truth, only just in a little different context. Read with me here in Romans 8 and verse 12. He says, Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. Now remember, he's talking to Christians here. There are Christians, people who believe and who are walking around dead inside because they are allowing the flesh to control them. If you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. And then notice what he says in verse 14. Same thing as in our text tonight. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. Now notice that Paul in that text is talking about being led somewhere that we're not debtors to the flesh, to live after the flesh. He said, you're really in debt to God. He bought and paid for you with his precious blood. And he's simply saying, yield to my spirit. Put to death the deeds of the body by the spirit, by the power of God. Not by your own willpower, not by your mind power, not by your self effort, your good works, no matter how spiritual those works may be, he said, let the Lord lead you in this manner. In fact, he said, this is what proves that you truly are a son of God. You see, what proves I am a true Christian is because I am putting to death the deeds of my body and I am not yielding to them I am yielding to the Spirit of God to allow that them to be removed from my life and I am following His lead. I'm following the direction and the voice of the Spirit when He says, Steve, that's sin. That anger, that adulterous thought, that, that pride, that outburst of anger, that jealousy, whatever work of the flesh it is. That's sin. Will you listen to my voice and follow my direction right now? And a person who believes in him will do that. And they will put to death the deeds of their body. Put this, these three verses here in Romans 8 into the context of what we're studying here and it's very clear the meaning that Paul has of where he is leading us. He's leading us to death, to put to death the deeds of the body, and he is leading us to life through the power of the Spirit if I will make that simple choice to respond to him. In 2 Timothy 2.19, Paul said there, let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Isn't that interesting? Just before that verse, he says, the Lord knows them that are his. This is what proves that I truly am his, is that because I name his name, I turn away from my iniquity because I am listening to the voice of the Spirit, allowing him to lead me 
to that place to put off the deeds of my body and to put on the spirit and the new man. Now, third and last, we come to verse 16. Notice, walk in the spirit and you will not or shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Now, how do you walk in the spirit? I mean, this is, a, this is first a command and you have to recognize it as a command. This is the first of seven points that I want to give to you. You must recognize that this is a command of God to walk in the Spirit. This, uh, this term here, walk in the Spirit, the word walk is in the present tense, and it is in the imperative in the Greek, which means that it is a command. The imperative is just the same as a command. So whenever you see that, this is a command. He's saying, literally, this should be translated, keep walking under the control of the Spirit. Now, keep walking under the control of the Spirit. Why? Because I began in the Spirit. Remember at the beginning of Galatians, he said, having begun in the Spirit, are you now going to be made perfect? by your own flesh, by your own efforts? And the answer is no. Your Christian life begins in the Spirit because you surrender to the Spirit's drawing and conviction and, and pleading, drawing you unto the Father. And so by faith, you come and His Spirit comes into you. And your Christian life begins in the Spirit. He's just saying, just keep doing how you, the same thing that you did when you first started. That's what verse 16 is all about. Just keep doing it. But it has to be seen as a command. Now, notice the fruit and the result of obeying this command. He says, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Now, this term here, shall not, is a double negative in the Greek. It is the most absolute statement Paul could have ever made. He is declaring here, if you walk in the Spirit, if you just keep walking in the Spirit, do you know what will happen? You will not, you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. It's, it, it can't happen. It won't happen because of the power of the Holy Spirit, not your will. Not your self-effort, not your ability, not your wisdom. It is by the power of the Spirit of God. Now, I have to come to these two conclusions. What's the problem? It's my flesh. What's the answer? It's the Holy Spirit. When I come to that, that conclusion, then I deal with my flesh instead of beating myself up, thinking I'm something terribly different from anybody else, and I trust and I cry out to and I receive the power of the Holy Spirit to change me from the inside out. Where I see something lacking, that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna say, Father, fill me, empower me, strengthen me, change me, by the power of your spirit. And when a believer does that, he cannot fulfill the lust of the flesh. When a believer does not do that, he will fulfill the lust of his flesh. He will fall in those fleshly areas. Many times we just don't stop. You know, you get a little riled, you get a little impatient, you get a little... Uh, antsy or, or whatever and you just you don't stop and pray and it's that simple every one of us does it I do it and you, you sit there and you just go wow why didn't I just you know close my mouth and just pray before I said something instead of just you know shoot that zinger out and it's that simple if I would stop and do that, there my answer and solution would be. When you cry out to the Holy Spirit, 
It's like pouring living water on the fire inside you. And you know what happens when you pour fire, water on a, on a campfire? Is it going to keep burning? No way. It's not going to keep burning. I can say to you with a double negative, it's not going to keep burning. No way, anyway, will that occur. How can I make that statement? How can I be so sure? Well, we've all done it. We know a fire cannot endure a bucket of water. It's not going to happen. The same thing is true with your flesh. If you really, truly believe that, then obey this command and walk this way. Keep walking this way. Now, secondly, you need to let the Spirit lead you to a revelation concerning these truths that I've shared with you tonight. All of these truths. This has to come as a revelation to your heart. I remember when the Lord used that, that analogy I just gave to you about water, living water, the living water of the Holy Spirit and a campfire. When he brought that to my heart and mind, I just went, I got it. But you know what? You, you don't seem to keep it long <laughs> because you, you go back to your own ways and your own self-effort because that is your nature, you see? That is your nature. And you have to learn this, and that's what maturing in Christ is all about. It takes some time to really learn this truth. And I don't, yet I, I can tell you, I'm sure not perfect at it. And I don't think I ever will be perfect at it until the day I meet the Lord. That's, that's the reality I believe. I am not what I used to be, but I'm surely not what I should be. I'm in that process, and every one of us is at a different place in that process. And so if you want that process to go faster, surrender. Let the Spirit lead you to this place of death and this place of life. Now this second issue of allowing the Spirit to lead you to revelation, in Romans 6, verse 6, it declares this, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. Paul said, you have to know this. The Greek word there for know is the, to experientially know something. There are two Greek words, one for an intuitive knowledge and one a knowledge that comes by experience. That's what Romans 6.6, 6, that's the word that is used there for knowing this. You have to know this by experience. And that can only come by a revelation of the Spirit. I had a fellow one time in my early Christian life, and he was trying to share with me. I was battling and struggling and failing, and he, he just said, Steve, you, you really need to know your old man was crucified 2,000 years ago on that cross with Christ. And I said, yeah, I know that, I know that. He goes, no, you don't know it. And, you know, you feel that pride kind of come up inside you, and you, you think, well, you know, who is this guy telling me this? But, you know, I realized, and he said, you know how I know you don't know it? Because you're failing. You're, you're falling. You're struggling. You're battling. That's how I know you don't know this. And I said, you're right. I don't know it. You need to just simply just pray and say, God, give me revelation. Give me that spiritual revelation of this truth to my heart that I might know not only were my sins, plural, crucified with you on that cross, but my sin nature was crucified with you too. You killed him. Now you're saying to yourself, well, Steve, if he killed him, if he's dead then what's going on inside of me? I mean, well, the point is, is that he is dead in Christ. He is not dead in you, okay? 
That's a very important truth. He's very much alive in you because you're alive in this body of sin right now. And until you die and get a new body, you're going to battle with him. He is dead in Christ. He is very much alive in you. That's why, if you go down to Romans 6, 11, he says, likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin. Now, why do you have to reckon something to be so? Well, that's taking a position of faith. You have to reckon something to be so because you believe it is so. Because it is an accomplished, finished work. Just like the finished work of Christ has forgiven you of your sin, the finished work of Christ has set you free from the power of your sinful nature. It's a done deal. But you must reckon it to be so. You must believe it to be so. When you take some side issue, when you take some alternate means to get victory, you are declaring you don't believe it true is true. When you look to willpower, when you look to mind power, when you look to your self-effort, you're declaring you don't really believe this is the case. You believe you have the power to change yourself. And there's a big difference between the two. Now, thirdly, you need to allow the Spirit to lead you to believe that God's Word is true. You have to believe, ask, let the Spirit lead you. Once you get the revelation, let Him lead you to the conclusion that this is the truth. That is also a work of the Spirit of God. The, notice, go down in our text here, verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is what? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. This word faithfulness, it's really a very poor translation of the, the word. The Greek word is translated the majority of times in the New Testament as just faith. Just faith. Not faithfulness. The majority of translations translate this faithfulness, which is a sad thing. Because they're, they're really not giving you the point. The Old King James translates this faith correctly. Uh, Young's literal translation of the scripture translates this faith. Very important. The fruit of the Holy Spirit is faith. If you want to believe God's truth, then you need to yield and allow him to lead you to this place of faith in these truths. Now, fourth, you need to let the Spirit lead you to a conviction and a full repentance over your sin. Now, this is important because excuses and blame shifting keep you bound to your sin. This is another great difficulty. Many times in counseling, I'm battling with a person, arguing with them that something is sin in the first place. And it's like we're spending all our time talking about whether or not this is sin or not instead of what to do with the sin. And many times I know that that's going on inside of every one of your minds as well. well is, this, is this okay or is this not okay? Should, should I be convicted about this? Should I not be convicted about this? And as long as we're playing that game, we're basically holding on to our sin, which means that you won't reckon it to be dead and you won't gain victory over it. So it is essential to be honest with yourself, allow the Holy Spirit to lead you to this conviction. Convict me, Lord. Now, how does the Lord convict you? He does that by His Holy Spirit, too. The Spirit is given to convict the world of sin and to convict a Christian of sin. And so just yield to him and let him do it. Let him lead you to this end. In Proverbs 28, 13, it says this, He who covers his sins will not prosper, 
but whoever confesses and forsakes them shall have mercy. The word covers there is a Hebrew word that means to conceal. So a person who conceals their sin to themselves or to others is holding on to their sin, and which means they will not get victory from that particular struggle. So allow the Spirit to lead you here. And then fifth, let the Spirit lead you to put them off. This is the decision to reckon, to reckon yourself to be dead indeed unto sin. It is a position of faith that you take. I believe that the word of God is true, that you declared that my old man was crucified. That's past tense, right? He was crucified. So I'm gonna believe that, Lord, because your Holy Spirit is causing me to first be, have this revelation and this understanding, and I'm convicted about my sin. I'm getting rid of this. I want to put this off. And that's what brings you to this place of reckoning. And so when you see that anger, that pride, that lust, the, the evil thoughts that are going through your mind, take a position of faith, Reckon yourselves dead to sin by just, just saying, Lord, I believe that that is the case. My sinful nature is dead. It doesn't have the right to rule me any longer. These thoughts don't have any, the right to rule me. This anger or pride or jealousy, it doesn't have the right to rule me. You have the right to rule me. And so I reckon this to be the case. And then number six Romans 6.13, he declares there as well, neither yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but yield yourselves to God as those who are alive from the dead. You see, that is a reality. You are alive from the dead. But you have to yield yourself to him as if you are alive. When I'm playing with sin, I'm yielding to sin as if I am dead and I'm going to experience death inside my life as a result. I need to make the opposite choice. Presenting myself, yielding myself to Him completely and totally. Are you presenting yourself to Him as one alive unto Him? every single day when you have your devotional time. I'm telling you, I pray this every single morning. It's on my prayer list. Lord, I, I reckon myself dead to sin and alive to you. You have the right to this body. You have the right to this mind. And only you. I surrender. I yield to you. I submit myself to you and I resist the devil and I know he has to flee from me. And there is where your victory will be found. Seventh and last, we let the Spirit lead you to control your thought life. Now, why do I put this at the end? Because this is where we stumble. This is where it starts. This is where the stumbling process starts. It's right in your head. You just play with a thought. It stirs up the fire of your sinful nature again. And you play with it. And then you act on it. Or you're just walking in death. A conflict occurs. And you blow it. You fail. It's kind of like a snowball. It just gets worse and worse. Haven't you had those days? You know, you start out. You just have that little little harsh or curt word with your spouse or your friend or your roommate or somebody at work and, and you just kind of hold it. You don't deal with it. You don't get rid of it. You don't do what the Spirit is leading you to do. And it just gets worse. And the next problem occurs and you don't deal with that right. And pretty soon, you just feel like, gosh, I just want to go home and just hide my head under the covers. I mean, I want this day over. 
it, that's what happens. I've had those days. You've had those days. Everybody does. And so I know you know what I'm talking about. Where does it begin? It begins right up here. Are you going to listen to the voice of God or are you going to listen to those desires of your own flesh? Are you going to bring captive your thoughts? It says in 2 Corinthians 10.5 that we are to bring every thought into the captivity of the obedience of Christ. Do you do that? I, I have to do this, gosh, multitudes of times every single day. I had to do it while I was worshiping here tonight. I had to do it while I was home, at home tonight. I had to do it as I was driving here tonight. You have to do it all the time. It is a decision when that fleshly thought goes through your mind of resentment, pride, <coughs> jealousy, adultery, whatever the issue might be. What are you going to do with that thought? Are you going to play with it? Or are you going to say, God, that's, that's sinful, that's evil, it's folly for me to think in that direction, and I submit myself to you and I reckon myself dead to sin and alive to you. You have the right to rule me. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. And you know what you, you'll do? You'll keep on walking in the Spirit if you do that. Not only the seventh issue that I just brought up of controlling your thought life, but as you obey every one of these principles, put them into practice, you will find the victory of walking in the Spirit, walking under the control of the Spirit in your life. Let's pray together.